So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Stephen Graves, and I'm actually a... Uh, well, it's gone half past ten. Oh, my apologies. I didn't know you were going to say anything. Okay, good morning everybody. My name's Jane Connolly. I'm from the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine. Um, this session um, in total, there are, there are two presentations, one on Q fever and then one on mental health. Um, this session will run for an hour. There's then a five minute break to allow you to move rooms um, or you can stay in this room and then the mental health presentation will be for 30 minutes. When this session is finished, you can rate and review the session on the app, and we would encourage you to do that. Um, a few housekeeping notes. If the emergency alarm sounds, you need to make your way to the nearest exit and not use the lifts. Uh, the toilets are out of the door and left. Please make sure your phones are on silent. There will be a conference photographer that will come into the room. If you don't want your photograph to be taken, you will need to let her know. This session is being recorded, so if you do have questions, we'll have a roving mic, and I ask you to wait until we get the microphone to you so that it can be picked up on the recording, which then means that you can actually view this recording after um, RMA conference has finished. Okay, so now I'm very pleased to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Stephen Grace, who's going to talk to us about Q fever. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming along. So I've been asked to come up here and, and speak to the Rural Doctors Association about Q fever, what it is, who gets it, and how to prevent it with Q -vax vaccination. And that's because New South Wales Health is actually having a campaign at the moment to try and to increase awareness. It's supposed to be picking up on this one. It's not. Can you bring it up a little bit? Is that better? Yes. So New South Wales Health is having a campaign at the moment to try and increase awareness of Q fever because there's quite a bit around. So that's, that's why I'm here. And uh, as I say, thank you very much for coming along. Uh, I'm the uh, medical director of the Australian Rickettsial Reference Laboratory, uh, which is a small boutique laboratory that diagnoses rickettsial diseases, including Q fever. But I'm also a part-time senior staff specialist in microbiology at Penrith in New South Wales. So what is Q fever? Well, it's an infectious disease. It's transmitted from animals to humans, so that means, by definition, it's a zoonosis. And it's caused by a bacterium called Coxiella bonetti. Uh, Cox was an American who was involved in the discovery, and Burnett was an Australian who was involved in the discovery, and so that's how it got its name. It's quite a common illness in rural and regional Australia, but it's often quite difficult to diagnose uh, by the doctor as it has no unique clinical features. However, once you've got the diagnosis, it is usually relatively easy to treat with appropriate antibiotics. So the difficult part is diagnosing it. And actually, unlike a lot of other illnesses, we can actually prevent it with a vaccine called QVAX, which is made here in Australia. Whose phone is this? Somebody's phone here. Okay. Uh, which can be prevented by vaccination. And Australia, it's an Australian vaccine developed here in Australia, and it's only actually available here in Australia. No one else uh, has it. So first of all, we have to go back to medical school, to Microbiology 101, and learn a little bit about Coxella bonetti. So bear with me if you're not really interested in the microorganism. I'll be coming to the interesting part. It's a gram-negative bacterium and it belongs to the gamma subgroup of the Proteobacteriaceae bacterial group. So these are big phyla of different bacteria. The most diverse form of life on Earth are the bacteria. And so this is one of the phyla divided into several groups. So it's not actually a true rickettsia because they belong to the alpha subgroup of this phylum. Its closest relative, living relative is actually the Legionella uh, bacteria, which causes Legionnaire's disease. So Legionnaire's disease, and people know a lot more about Legionnaire's disease than they do Q fever, actually. They're actually very similar illnesses caused by very similar organisms. 
The Coxella is a genus, it's an extremely interesting genus, because the many, many members of it actually live as endosymbionts within invertebrate cells, particularly within ticks. And one of these is Coxella bonetti. So Coxella bonetti does in fact live inside some ticks, and you can actually get Q fever from a tick bite, although it's not the normal way to get it. But endosymbionts are very, very important. We have an important endosymbiont in our cells, which is actually the mitochondria. The mitochondrion, eons ago, was actually a free-living bacterium, and it actually became part of our cell. Plant cells have a chloroplast for photosynthesis. That's also an endosymbiont, which was a free-living bacteria many, many years, well, millions of years ago. So Coxella have been around for a long time, and Coxella bonetti is the one that causes Q fever. Now, Q uh, Coxella bonetti transfers between mammals and ticks, and in Australia, there are many native mammals that are involved, uh, bandicoots, kangaroos, wombats. So people that work with wildlife can, in fact, get Q fever from these animals. And there are several tick species uh, that cycle it between the tick and the animal. And some of these are tick species that bite humans, such as the paralysis tick, Exodus holocyclus, the ornate kangaroo tick, Amblyomum trichotatum and others as well, and they carry Coxella bonetti. Now, the interesting thing about Q fever is that when animals get it, they usually do not become unwell. So when you look at an animal, or when a vet looks at an animal, or an ordinary person looks at an animal, they can't tell whether it's infected or not. So a farmer may have an infected cattle herd, and it appears perfectly normal, but it can still transmit infection to humans. And sometimes the very first indication that a farmer's herd of cattle, sheep or goats are actually infected with Q fever is when someone in the family or someone on his staff comes down with Q fever. Uh, goats are the exception to this rule because they often have an increased rate of abortion. So there was a reasonably big outbreak in Victoria a couple of years ago at a goat farm, a milking goat farm, and the first thing that was observed was that the abortion rate in the goats went up and the farmer didn't know why and then people on the farm started coming down with Q fever and that's when he found out. Um, as the animals abort or give birth, the, the, uh, the uh, parturient products are very, very heavily contaminated with Coxella bonetti and they contaminate the environment and that's the focus for people being infected by aerosol spread. Now this is actually an electromicrograph of a cell. It's actually a macrophage. This is the cell membrane, right, around here. This is the nucleus of the uh, cell. Whoops, sorry. What happened then? These are, these are tricky things to work with, aren't they? But this is a cytoplasmic vacuole. You see the huge vacuole inside here, and that's full of replicating Coxella bonetti. So you can see how many cells can come from the one infected cell. So this is one of these has been taken up by the cell and has been able to grow. And you'll notice that there are long forms. They're called the large cell variety, and they're the actively replicating forms. They're growing. And then there's the very small ones like this, and this, and this. And they're, they're the small cell forms. They're like a spore so that when the cell breaks open and releases it, these are the ones that survive in the environment. Okay. So who gets Q fever? Well, it's actually an infection of two groups of people. People have a certain occupation, people who are associated with animals, not necessarily working with them, but just being near them or using them as part of their hobby or something like that and also people who live in rural and regional parts of the world. Not just Australia, this is a worldwide disease. Now in Australia, the data on Q fever, incidence of Q fever is very unreliable, but assuming it's equally unreliable across the whole of the country, the incidence varies according to the following um, criteria, uh, following order, so it's more in Queensland than New South Wales and so on. Here's a fairly old map of cases of Q fever, and you can see particularly heavy in southern, southeast Queensland and northeastern New South Wales. And this is really not surprising, of course, because the population densities are, are high here, so you'd expect more cases. 
Yep, I, I suspect because A, it's an old slide, and B, it's often not diagnosed because you need, usually need good laboratory facilities to diagnose it. So I suspect this is a completely false negative reading. I've often wondered that myself. <laughs> Now, the, the uh, animal association, as I've mentioned, can be farm animals, cattle, sheep and goats, uh, particularly goats, but all of these animals are involved in Australia. Native animals, in Australia it's bandicoots, kangaroos, possums, and in other countries it's other native animals. And also domestic animals, so cats and dogs can get it as well. And there have been some very notable city-based cases where people's cats and dogs have got Q fever. Uh, but generally speaking, it's the farming community and the farming animals are, are the main problem because we have, there's more of them and we have more intimate contact with them, I guess. The danger to persons occurs when a pregnant animal gives birth and the environment is contaminated. Men have a much higher risk than women, and people have wondered about this and originally put it down to the fact that there were more men working directly with the animals, but it's, it's, it's much more than that. It, it, we, there's some evidence that oestrogen is protected and even in other animal species other than humans it's the male animals that get a much more severe infection than the female animals so for example I'm working on a new vaccine for Q fever and I always use male guinea pigs rather than female guinea pigs because they give a more exuberant fever and I can measure their clinical course much more readily so men do get it worse than ladies <laughs> it's not just in the mind <laughs> The other interesting thing about Q fever is that middle-aged persons are at highest risk. So this is the opposite to what we normally think of with infections, where you think of the very young and the very old are at greatest risk. But in Q fever, it's the other way around, and I'll show you some uh, graphs of that. But everywhere in the world this is true, so it's been shown many, many times. And the incidence of Q fever increases in dry, windy weather, especially during drought like we've got now. Until quite recently, I was diagnosing in my laboratory one new case of acute Q fever every week. Now I'm diagnosing three or four every week. So the incidence is definitely going up. And I think that's partly due to the drought. And these spore forms, the small cell variety that I showed you in that electron micrograph, uh, they are the ones that survive in the environment and they can actually survive for years in the environment. So old slaughterhouses, old shearing sheds, they can still be a source of infection for people who have come many many years later, and they get, the, the spores get blown by the wind, and so anyone living downwind of the site, and it's a decreasing risk, so the further away you are, the less your risk. But if you're within, well, say, one kilometre, you are definitely at risk of getting Q fever. And that was shown in the big Dutch outbreak uh, from a couple of years ago, where there were dairy goat farms, had big outbreak of Q fever, and thousands of people in the Netherlands got infected, and the closer they lived to a dairy goat farm, the greater their risk of getting Q fever. So I'm sorry this is not a terribly large slide, but what I wanted to show you here was the different local health districts in New South Wales. And just look at this column here. This is the rate of Q fever per 100,000 population. And the, the point, the take-home message is that Western New South Wales, Northern New South Wales and far Western New South Wales, they had the highest rates because that's where Q fever is. Now, they don't have the highest population, not the, not the greatest number of cases. Now, that's actually Hunter, New England. But so it's, it's, there's very much a rural and regional bias in Q fever. So it's very important for doctors uh, working in rural and regional Australia to know about Q fever. And you can see Sydney is, is right at the very bottom there. <laughs> now, here's the graph I was telling you about. The black are males and the blue are females and these are the different age groups and so it's a really interesting age distribution curve and so people from about 30 to about 70 are at the greatest risk and what I put this down to no one really knows for sure but what I put this down to is the fact that as people start working leaving school and leaving universities and colleges and start working they expose themselves to a greater risk and that risk is cumulative the more and more time, the more likelihood you are of getting infected with Q fever. Then you're immune or you retire. And of course, the younger age groups are not so likely to be exposed to infected animals, so they're less likely to be infected. Um, in terms of vaccination, I actually think the sensible time to vaccinate 
uh, young people would be in their last year of school in rural and regional areas of Australia uh, before they start hitting the high risk uh, age groups. But you do, we do see cases in teenagers and, and children. And it can be quite an unpleasant disease in, in young children. Very hard to treat as well. So this is uh, where I've done some research work in the Hunter New England region of New South Wales, which is the northeastern part of New South Wales. And these are the local government areas, LGAs. And the interesting thing is these three, these ones up here are all the very rural ones, Gyra, Gunnedah, Tenterfield, Narrabri. Look at the seroprevalence. 22%, 21%, 18%. One in five people are being exposed to Coxella Bonetti. Now, they've not all got Q fever, of course, but they've been exposed, so they could have got it. Whereas if you go down to the city, Newcastle, it's only 0.5%. And overall, for the Hunter New England region, it's 7%. And that's pretty much what it's like for regional and rural New South Wales overall. And Queensland would probably be a little bit higher. So here's an incident and hazard ratio for notified new Q fever in New South Wales according to various socio-demographic socio characteristics. The only one I want you to look at is this column here, okay? So this is incidence per 100,000 person years. So if you live in a major city, your risk is 0.2, your risk ratio 0.2. If you live in an inner region and not on a farm, it's 2.5, so it's going up. If you live in an outer region or a remote region not on a farm, it goes up to 5.5. If you live in an inner region on a farm, so this is the inner region not on a farm, 2.5, inner region on a farm, goes up to 13.8 times. This is not percent, this is times. But if you live in an outer region and on a farm, it goes from 5.5 to 33.3 .3 times greater risk. So you can see the importance of this disease in rural and regional communities. Not a big problem in the city, and city doctors don't know a lot about it, but I'm hoping that rural and regional doctors do. So now I'm going to get to the part of the disease. That's the epidemiology and the microbiology done with. Now I'm going to talk about the actual disease that I'm sure you'll be most interested in. So it's a complicated disease, Q fever, and there are various stages associated with it, and patients can present in different ways and at different times. So the first category, very briefly, is asymptomatic seroconversion. I won't say too much about that. Acute Q fever, that's how you'll mostly see the patient present with acute Q fever. Sometimes, the first time you see your patient will be the chronic Q fever. So chronic Q fever, there's a school of thought now that it should be called focal persistent Q fever, so I've, I've used both terms because uh, they're both in use in the literature. Uh, the post-Q fever fatigue syndrome is not widely recognised, but it's definitely a real thing, uh, no doubt about it. And then, of course, there's the past Q fever, the person that's had it and is now immune. So we'll talk about those uh, one by one. And look, um, let's make this in the form of a tutorial, if you like. So if there's any questions you've got at any point, just shout out and I'll be happy to deal with it, So rather than wait, wait till the end. So asymptomatic seroconversion, that means you've been exposed to a microbe, you've mounted an immune response, you haven't even noticed you, you haven't got sick. It happens to us all the time. We've all been exposed to all sorts of things and we don't know about it. Now, what is the rate of asymptomatic seroconversion in Q fever? Well, every outbreak seems to be different. In some outbreaks, it's only 15%. In other outbreaks, it can be as high as 90%. And what's the reason for the difference? Well, your guess is as good, my, good as mine. There must be a whole bunch of reasons. In the outbreak at Meredith, the, uh, the Victorian outbreak I was telling you about, 21% uh, of the patients were asymptomatic. But in the big outbreak in the Netherlands, where there were thousands and thousands of cases, 90% of them were asymptomatic. So clinically, you're only seeing the, the, the top of the iceberg. Um, now, in the Dutch outbreak, because it was, there were so many that were symptomatic, even though they were only 10%, even though there were so many symptomatic, there was a lot of public health concern about it, as, as you'd expect. And so a lot of um, study went into what was going on, and the public health authorities in the Netherlands actually bled a lot of people who lived in the areas where the outbreak was occurring. And so we, they had serum from them, even though they were perfectly healthy and they were able to then see how many of them actually had antibodies, had been exposed. And remember, they weren't sick. 
Uh, normally, of course, we wouldn't know what the background end endemic asymptomatic seroconversion like is because we don't test normal people, healthy people don't go and see the doctor. So we can do some of those studies by looking at blood banking sera, and we've just completed a study at the moment, which has not yet been published, uh, lo looking at the background levels. But again, um, it's usually a, it's, it's around about seven or eight percent in rural areas, and a couple of percent lower in the cities. But just because someone hasn't got symptoms doesn't mean they haven't been exposed. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about asymptomatic seroconversion. Acute, acute fever is where the money is. This is where the patient presents to sick as a dog, usually. Uh, they've usually been sick for a couple of days with what people call a flu-like illness, although the respiratory symptoms are actually quite minor. They've basically got a fever and they feel really sick. Um, and I'll show you some features in a moment. But the problem is there's nothing that tells you this is Q fever. There's no pathognomic, pathognomic features. And it is difficult to diagnose clinically without a good history or without epidemiological clues. So if someone tells you about their animal exposure and they've just pulled a car or they've done something like that, the penny should drop, drop and you'll think of Q fever. But if you don't have that information, then you might not think of it. So they come in with fever. Uh, muscle pains, headaches. Now, they nearly all have a hepatitis. They may not, you may not actually detect an enlarged liver, and of course, you almost certainly won't do a liver biopsy, but if you were to do it, you'd show that there were granulomas there. Um, but their liver function tests are off. So the liver function transaminases are always up several times normal, not to the extent that a viral hepatitis would be, not in the thousands, but just in the hundreds. The other main features, they're often very fatigued and they've often got uh, joint pains as well. There are some rare manifestations of Q fever which people often don't, the penny doesn't drop as to the diagnosis until they've been in hospital for a couple of days. Uh, cholecystitis, quite a few people have had their gallbladders taken out, uh, hemophagocytic syndrome and uh, DIC. Uh, so it can be quite a lethal disease and there can be neurological complications as well. So this is our study we've done on 350 cases of acute fever, acute Q fever in New South Wales. Uh, the main feature we found was myalgia, followed by fever, headache, hepatitis, as shown by liver function tests, not by biopsy, acute fatigue, arthralgia, respiratory symptoms, occasionally a rash. Now this is interesting, only 15% of people have a rash. So that helps you distinguish Q fever from rickettsial diseases which often overlap in terms of epidemiology because the rickettsial disease people nearly always have a rash. And 9% have neurological symptoms, which can be a whole range of things. The minimum infectious dose for Cox Elevenetti to infect a human is about 10 microbes. Now, that is incredibly small. Can you imagine how much you would have to inhale to inhale 10 microbes? I'm probably inhaling more than 10 microbes right now as I'm breathing and talking to you. So it's a very, very low infectious dose. And the phase one is the virulent form. I'm not going to talk about the avirulent form, but the virulent form is, well, very virulent. It's, it can establish an infection. But the thing that's tricky with Q fever is that the latent period can be very, very long. And this latent period is defined as the time from actual infection to onset of symptoms. And if you've got a heavy exposure, let's say you inhale 10 to the 6th uh, Cox Elevenetti, you might get sick in two weeks. Two weeks! Not like the flu virus where it's a couple of days. If you get a light exposure, like say 100 organisms, it might be two months before you actually get sick. So you have to ask, have you been exposed to animals, particularly birthing animals, up to two months ago? Because it certainly wasn't the last few days. The duration of the symptoms of acute Q fever is quite standard, actually. Everybody says it lasts from seven to 10 days. That's untreated, of course. Uh, people that don't actually go to see the doctor, they sit it out, sweat it out at home, and they get better after seven to 10 days. But 20 to 50% of people actually get hospitalised, they're that sick enough, and it varies according to the outbreak, of course. Recovery occurs nearly always, uh, spontaneously, this is without treatment, uh, with a 1% mortality. So 99% recover, 1% die, but 
they suffer during those seven to ten days. They're, they're really crook. And if you're able to make the diagnosis or think of the diagnosis and start them off on doxycycline, which is the drug of choice, you really will help a lot because they'll get better within 24 to 48 hours. Now, that's all I wanted to say about acute uh, Q, Q fever. I'll just... Yes? Go back. So I stole that off you. Um, <laughs> just a question about the neurological complications. Um, in Orange, we've had a couple of um, meningoencephalitis, so unclear cause. Um, uh, f for the neurological complications, is it any like antibody related, or is it actual microbe related? Um, and is CSF culture positive for Q fever? Uh, because we've uh, a couple of those people were farmers, and there was a sort of presumed diagnosis. Um, and they seem to get better with doxycycline, but maybe it was something else completely. Yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> you can do a lumbar puncture, and the CSF usually doesn't have the organisms in it. Sometimes it can be PCR positive. Uh, but as I'll show later when I talk about the actual laboratory diagnosis, uh, culture's just too difficult and too slow. So your best way to make a diagnosis is PCR on blood, uh, or, or later in the illness, serology, look for antibodies. So, uh, um, but I think if, if, if the, the epidemiology fits, giving a short course of doxycycline is actually quite a good diagnostic test. How long before the antibodies Yes, I'm coming to that. It's a, a couple of weeks usually, unfortunately. So while the patient's unwell, they will be antibody negative. So your best bet is to ask for a PCR then. Send a blood specimen for PCR. Hmm. Whilst you're on this slide, which of the various symptoms is actually so sufficiently severe as to provoke the hospitalisation. <sighs> Usually, it seems to it seems to vary. I think it's the, the the hospital emergency department doctors that I've spoken to about this, they usually say they just look so bloody crook, and we didn't know what was wrong with them. We thought we put them into hospital until we got got it sorted out. So they're usually not diagnosed as Q fever at that stage. They've just been put into hospital because they just look so awful. So. That's not my very helpful, I know. But, and sometimes it takes several days to get the diagnosis of Q fever before the penny drops. Hmm. Just two questions. Uh, is Q fever in horses? Yeah, good question. I wish I could answer that. Um, it's, a, it's a matter of dispute at the moment. I think the answer is probably yes, but it's not one of the major uh, vertebrate species. And, and can it be transmitted human to human? Sorry, what was that? Can it be transmitted between humans? Uh, no, not normally. There have been a couple of very, very rare cases where it has been transmitted between humans, but it's not normally. Normally, if people in the same family get it, it's because they've got it from a common environmental source. They've all been exposed to the same infected sheep or whatever. There has been one report of a sexual transmission, um, and there has been because it can be in the, in the semen of men um, if they've got a chronic infection, and there has been a case of an obstetrician who got infected while doing a caesarean section on a lady whose fetus was infected. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're way out cases. Normally, you get it from an animal or the environment that's been contaminated by the animal. Move on. So moving now to chronic, or as some people call it, focal persistent. And focal persistent sort of gives the pathogenesis away, Q fever. And this form of Q fever occurs months to years after the initial infection, which may in fact have been very, very mild or even asymptomatic. So the first time the doctor sees the patient is when they present with chronic Q fever. And it's due to a persistence of a focus of viable coxylvaneti in the patient's body due to inadequate immune response. Now, I said most people recover normally. Uh, the immune system gets on top of it, but occasionally it doesn't. And these are the people that get chronic Q fever. If they've had adequate antibiotic treatment, they won't get chronic Q fever, okay? But if they just take a couple of tablets and forget to take the rest, they might. The clinical features are gradual onset of increasing poor health in the patient, so it's not acute at all. They're, they're, they're just gradually going downhill. They can have endocarditis, cardiac failure, particularly if they've got an artificial valve. So if you've got any patients with an artificial valve, you have to think, yes. Vasculitis, especially if there's an aneurysm present somewhere or a vascular prosthesis present. Osteomyelitis and discitis and hepatitis. So 
it can present in a variety of ways. It is often quite hard to make the diagnosis of chronic acute fever, and serology is very helpful here because the serology will be hot, hot, hot. It's the most serious form of Q fever with a significant mortality. It's still about 30% mortality with, with treatment, and it's close to 100% without treatment. So it's not to be sniffed at, but the good thing is it represents only about 1% to 3% of all Q fever cases. So about 1% to 3% of people who get acute Q fever who don't get any treatment will go on to get chronic Q fever. So it's not a, not a likely outcome, but it's a very significant outcome. And children are occasionally uh, you know, seen with osteomyelitis as a, a, as a manifestation of chronic Q fever. <clears throat> All right, any, any questions on chronic Q fever before I move on to the next form? Uh, just wondering if there's any antibiotic resistance yet with any Q fever. Sorry, I didn't hear it. Any antibiotic resistance to doxycycline? Uh, good question and very relevant. Um, but so far, no, we haven't seen any antibiotic resistance to Q fever. So doxycycline is the go, and every case has responded so far, mm. in Australia anyway. Hang on, wait for the microphone so the people at the back can hear you. <laughs> Patients on steroids, are that like farmers on inhalers, are that higher risk? We really, don't, we really don't know, but any form of immunosuppression has to make it less likely that the microbe's going to be cleared adequately, isn't it? So I don't know the exact answer, but the, the heavier the immunosuppression, the more likelihood they are that they're going to get chronic Q fever. And pregnant women is an interesting example. If you're pregnant and you get Q fever, you're more likely to get the chronic form because you've got an in, a form of immunosuppression. Mm. All right, I'll move uh, on now. So oh, just one, one more question? Yeah. Oh, two more questions. Yeah, so with the chronic Q fever, do you treat it with the doxy, and if so, for how long? Mm. And um, when it stops working, is the treatment symptomatic? Do you have to look for all of those potential... Uh, well, the, tre the treatment of chronic Q... <coughs> Excuse me. Got it. The treatment of chronic Q fever is very complicated and I would definitely in, uh, suggest you refer such a patient to an infectious disease physician. Don't try and treat it yourself. It's, it's 18 months to 24 months of treatment, a mixture of doxycycline and um, something else which I've forgotten at the moment. Uh, and then sometimes that doesn't work, so you've got to have other combinations of antibiotics. So it's a long, drawn-out process. You monitor the patient clinically and serologically, look for the antibody levels to fall. But it's definitely not something you should tackle as a, as a, as a GP, I don't think. It's, just, it's, it's tricky. Sometimes you have to have a PET scan as well to work out exactly where the focus of infection is. <coughs> Sorry. There was another question, yes. Should I vaccinate my farmer's wives from gyra before they get pregnant? Yes. Yeah. Right. So now I'd like to move on to something that you may not have heard about yet, but it's only just really starting to hit the textbooks and be generally recognised worldwide. And this is called the post-Q fever fatigue syndrome. And it occurs in about 10% of persons who are infected with Q fever. So it's quite a high percentage. And some studies in some countries suggest 15 or 20 percent. So it can be even higher than 10 percent. And it's a chronic fatigue syndrome that presents either 6 or 12 months after the acute onset of Q fever. Now, I say 6 or 12 because different schools of thought in different parts of the world are arguing about how long it should be. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's after they've had Q fever, they don't, they don't get better and they continue to have chronic fatigue. It's very debilitating, very debilitating, and it often occurs in very hard-working, conscientious patients who are very keen to get well and get on with their lives. So it is not, not like the classic uh, chronic fatigue syndrome patient who's been unwell for years and keeps coming back and can't get better. These people have perfectly well, they get Q fever, then they're fatigued, and it really buggers their lives because they can't get on with what they're doing and they want to get better. Uh, it's difficult. Um, the way you diagnose it is to show that they had Q fever by serology, but there's no serological pattern that particularly identifies the fatigue syndrome. All the serology shows is has been exposed to Coxella bonetti. I have been looking for a pattern for the last 20 years and I can't find one. So there is a, I don't think there is one. 
So unfortunately, there's no laboratory test that will diagnose it. It's a clinical diagnosis in people who've got antibodies to coxalabinetti. It's most likely to occur in patients with the severe symptoms of acute Q fever, and this was shown in the Dubbo study, and it's very similar to the post-fatigue, post-infectious fatigue that occurs after Ross River virus and Epstein-Barr virus. So it's probably something to do with the way the patient's immune system processes the antigens associated with that microbe. So it's to do with the patient's immune system, not the microbe as such. And the good news is, it usually disappears with time. So you can tell your patient it will go with time, but the duration is very variable. Some cases it can last for a year or more, others it can last for many years. So it's, it's really a horrible thing, and there's no effective treatment really, except you know su support, emotional support, and helping the patient along. So, um, any any questions on the post Q fever fatigue syndrome? It's a very hard condition to treat. If you can recognise it and tell your patient that's what they've got, that actually seems to help them. Um, but uh, there's no, there's no med medicine that helps. People have said that a gradual exercise program helps, but I don't know whether that's genuine or whether it's just the fact that the doctor's taking an interest in the patient that really helps with the improvement. All right, so I'll move on to past exposure to Cox Elbonetti. So this is detected when you do a test for a patient with a view to giving them the vaccine. So someone comes in for the vaccine, you do the test, it's usually a phase two IgG. I'm not going to go into the complexities of the serology, we haven't got time. Uh, they're usually seropositive and you think, oh, this person's been exposed and so you don't vaccinate them. And it's not uncommon in rural and regional Australia, I should say, not just Queensland and New South Wales. The patient usually can't recall an episode of acute fever and it's probably asymptomatic infection with seroconversion. So they're the clinical manifestations or the clinical groups. And here's the take-home slide. So a person in Australia gets infected with Q fever, Coxella Bonetti. 80% of them develop acute Q fever and 20% are asymptomatic seroconversion. Now this 80-20 this split is based on one study only in Meredith because we don't have many outbreaks of Q fever in Australia. We have endemic, low-level endemic cases scattered around the country. We don't have big outbreaks. So that ratio could easily change with more data. With the acute Q fever, 88% recover and develop immunity, 2% develop chronic Q fever with an active ongoing infection, and 10% develop the post-Q fever fatigue syndrome. So that's the sort of pattern as with the knowledge we've got at the moment. It could well change though. So I'm just going to say a little bit about laboratory diagnosis. As you know, I'm a medical microbiologist. So, but what's the most important part of the laboratory diagnosis of acute fever is for you, the treating doctor, to think of it in your differential diagnosis and mention acute fever on your laboratory request form. Because we're not allowed to test for acute fever unless you ask. That's called over-servicing, and I can go to prison for that. <laughs> so I'm not allowed to do it. So you've got to say acute fever before I can test for acute fever. The differential diagnosis are viral infection, of course, <coughs> influenza, if there's an particularly if there's an epidemic, leptospirosis in dairy and banana farmers, brucellosis in pig hunters, non-endemic fevers in returned overseas travellers such as malaria and dengue, septicemia caused due to all sorts of things, especially staph aureus, and rickettsial infections such as Queensland tick typhus, scrub typhus, and Flinders Island spotted fever. Yes, can we have a mic over here, please? <coughs> so there's quite a lot of ways differential diagnosis for someone with Q fever. So <clears throat> international tra travel, and particularly things like safaris, are very co becoming much more common, much more frequent. So should we be testing for Q fever in returned travellers who might otherwise have a malaria or a dengue? Mm. Well, actually, the evidence is that they don't have Q fever that often, but they often have rickettsial infections. So they, they go to South Africa and go, go on a game safari and they get bitten by a tick. So for return travellers with fevers that are not malaria, uh, always test for dengue and rickettsial infections. And of course, the golden rule of travel medicine, a fever in a return traveller is malaria until proven otherwise. That is the golden rule. So you must rule out malaria. But uh, dengue, uh, rickettsial infections, some of those odd viral infections, you know, that are around that we don't have here. 
Uh, but certainly, uh, queue fever if you, if you can't get to the bottom of it, but it's not that common in return travellers. Unless they've gone to rural areas, it's quite common in return military personnel who've been fighting or serving in rural areas of Afghanistan, Iraq, or something like that. <coughs> so, in most infections, we go for culture first, such as a midstream urine, a sputum, a blood culture. If that doesn't give us an answer, we go for molecular detection, such as the polymerase chain reaction, PCR, which is <laughs> jargon for look for the DNA of the microorganism. And if that doesn't work, we go for serology, which is a real backdoor sort of way of making the diagnosis, because you're not looking for the microbe, you're looking for the antibody that the patient has produced to the microbe. And in Q-fever, it's all the other way around. So serology is by far the most important diagnostic methodology then molecular detection, and culture you hardly ever use. It's actually very dangerous to do culture, and my laboratory is the only laboratory in Australia that actually cultures for cocktail Bonetti. We have a spe special biological safety level three lab, and we've got experienced staff, and they've all been vaccinated, I might add. <laughs> and we haven't had any cases of Q fever amongst our staff. But, so in the first week of illness, if, if the patient's only been weak for a, sorry, if the patient's only been sick for a week or less, the molecular PCR is likely to be positive, but the serology is likely to be negative. That was the comment that the lady made at the back of the room. So early in the illness, the immune system hasn't started producing antibodies yet, so serology will be negative, but it'll be a false negative. So you mustn't be misled by it. But if you ask for PCR as well, uh, send an EDTA blood, because the, mi the microbes are usually associated with the white cells. So if you just send serum, you reduce your chances. In the second week of acute illness, ask for both, because either could be positive. The PCR could be positive and the serology could be positive. But after the second week, into the third week and later, don't bother asking for PCR because the bacteremic phase is over, the microbe's not circulating anymore, and you have to rely on the antibodies, uh, positive antibodies. So that's the, that's the protocol. If you just remember PCR and serology and write that on the request form, that'll be enough. Uh, where I've worked in rural Queensland, I've heard a lot of doctors say they're deterred to test for Q fever because of the cost mm. uh, associated with the test and the fact that um, a lot of these tests get, have to get sent down to Brisbane and the results don't come back for a couple of weeks or so, by which mm. stage the acute illness is resolved yeah. um, and it then becomes for academic purposes. Um, That's right. What's the approximate cost of each of these tests compared well, my to... The in my laboratory, we bulk build them all, but you've got to get the sample to Geelong, of course, so yep. there would be a transportation cost. But if you write on the request slip, say you use um, what, what, some other pathology service, and you write on it, please send to Dr. Graves, Australian Rickettsia Reference Laboratory, Geelong, most of them will send it on. Uh, some of them don't. <laughs> but if you ask that, but you're right, the time span can be quite long, and, and by the time you get the result back, the patient's got better. So it doesn't actually help that patient, I grant you. But if you get someone else come in with a similar thing at about the same time, you know, there's a little bit of a mini outbreak associated with a particular farm or particular abattoirs or something like that. It can be helpful. So, as a, as a general rule, I think it's nice to know what the diagnosis is, even though your patient's got better. And your patient may have got better, but you haven't given them any doxycycline. So, when you get the Q fever result, definitely call them back in and give them two weeks of doxycycline so they don't develop the chronic form or they don't have the slight risk of getting the chronic Q fever. So, yeah. That's the problem of being a rural and remote doctor. You're a long way from anywhere, but, and you have to use your, your clinical acumen. But at the end of the day, the lab results will come back to you. I mean, how aggressively do you think we should be looking for this in the Northern Territory? And a quick comment, if I may just add on there. Um, I spend about, and have for the last 10 years, spend about six months each year working in Tennant Creek. And you would not think that we would see like Ross River or Barmer Forest, but we do, mm -hmm. because the people from there take their tinnies up to the bloody Gulf and, and mm. have fun up there mm. and then come back ill. Mm. And I'm just thinking now, maybe I should be adding Q fever mm. to the Ross River and the Barmer Forest. Over yes, you. I agree you should. I, I'd be prepared to bet my house on the fact that there's quite a lot of Q fever in the Northern Territory. It's just not being clinically recognised and the, the, the pathology requesting is just not going through to the pathology lab. Mm -hmm. How long after the acute illness is it still worth giving doxycycline? Any time. Any time. Yeah, so even if they come be, to me be, be a year later, down the track years later. and say, I'm still tired, I had flu about There's a year ago and ever since then, 
if you've got made the diagnosis and they haven't had doctors like there could be a focus in the endocardium or something that will ultimately over the next few years grow up. And so even if my pre-vaccination serology is positive, I'll treat them for two weeks? Well, if the pre-vaccination serology is positive, you shouldn't be vaccinated. No, no, that's what I meant. But I would always order serology before I plan to vaccinate, so would therefore find some people who are positive. Oh, so I see what you're yes. saying. Sorry, I misunderstood yeah. your question. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't treat them. But anyone that's had clinically obvious right. Q fever and diagnosed as such, I would give them doxycycline. Yeah. Okay. Mm. But not if you just pick it up en passant. Yeah. Yep. So just following for the last question, if somebody um, has positive serology but hasn't been ill, then you wouldn't give them doxycycline? Correct, I wouldn't, no. Okay. You have to draw the line. Some of my infectious disease colleagues don't even agree with me about giving doxycycline to someone that's spontaneously recovered from clinical Q fever. So that's, that's my personal view, but it's not, not held by everybody in the community, shall I say. Prevention of Q fever, uh, reduced exposure to infected carriers and animals, easier said than done. Respiratory protection, easier said than done. They're all difficult. The best way is vaccination with QVAX. And QVAX is a whole cell kill vaccine made from an Italian strain of, of Coxella bonetti, funnily enough, not an Australian strain. It's made by a local company in Melbourne. If you've got shares in CSL, you should be pretty happy because it's doing pretty well. <laughs> It's been available in Australia for 30 years, so we've had 30 years of experience with it, and it is actually a very effective vaccine, and there have been very few failures that have been documented. It's very safe if given to persons without prior contact with Coxella bonetti, uh, but you must, and here's the problem, you must screen the patients with a skin test and serology before vaccination, and thus QVAX is more difficult to use than most vaccines. And I'm going to demonstrate how to do that in a moment, as soon as I stop talking. Uh, so you ask the patient they've had Q fever in the past, and if they say yes, obviously you don't vaccinate them. Um, if they've had been vaccinated in the past, you never give the vaccine twice. Never give this vaccine twice. If they're a meat worker, you can check on the Q fever register and see whether they've been vaccinated as part of another job. Uh, and then this is important. You must make sure that the patient can return in seven days because that's when you've got to read the skin test. So if they're going off and up, overseas trip or they're going to be somewhere else and can't come back in seven days, find another time to do it. Arrange the Q fever serology. Now, this is what you request. Pre-vaccination Q fever serology phase 2 IgG. You don't have to put that bit in. But if you put pre-vaccination Q fever serology, you'll get a much faster result because it's a different range of serologies done if you're trying to make a diagnosis. So, And then the skin test. You have to dilute the skin test reagent 1 in 30. I'm going to demonstrate this in a moment. An intradermal inoculation of 0.1 ml. It's a bit tricky. Not that hard, but can be tricky. I'll go through that in a minute. Uh, so if the, if the, if the if serology is positive, you don't vaccinate. If the skin test is positive, you don't vaccinate. And a positive skin test is any induration of the skin at the inoculation site, but not a colour change. So don't be misled by colour change. You've got to actually feel a little bump there. So a negative serology, negative skin test, vaccinate, 0.5 ml QVAC subcutaneously. Now here's the thing that people forget. Immunity takes two weeks to develop. So you've got to make sure the person is not exposed or put into a job where they're really exposed to Q fever in this interim period. And there'll be quite a few cases of Q fever after someone's been vaccinated because they've gone straight to work on the slaughter line or whatever. So there are side effects associated with the vaccine, but the take-home message is if you do the skin test and the serology and they're negative, the vaccination side effects are no more than any other vaccine. But if they have got positive skin test or positive serology, they could have a very nasty reaction, and that's why we do it. Okay? So actually, I'm just going to go back now to this slide. So I'll leave this on, I'll leave this on the board while I actually do the demonstration. And that's the last thing, that's the end then. So I don't know whether you want to come a little bit closer or not, but this is the, um, <clears throat> this is the skin test reagent that you actually get from Sequiris. It's not the vaccine, but it's actually a very, very diluted form of the vaccine. All right? And what you've got to do, and this is the thing that really annoys me about Sequiris, is the Sequiris lady here? <laughs> this, sorry, just close your ears. This is really annoys me about Sequiris because I don't work for them or anything, is that they don't provide the diluent with it. You've got to find your own diluent. 
So luckily I've got <laughs> some water for injection. <laughs> so, and you get, there's 0.5 of the ml in here. And it's, you, it's, you just write a script for that and get it Yeah, from the yep, 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 yep. So there it is there. Oops, still oh, there's a bump there in the table. Is anyone going to volunteer to have it done to them or do I have to get my sequirus lady? <laughs> anyone willing to be a guinea pig? Good on you, thanks very much. So then you've got to get, so if this is point, here's a little arithmetic test for you. If this is 0.5 ml and I've got to do one in 30 dilution, how much saline do I need? <laughs> oh, bugger. <laughs> okay. I'm going to have to use the needle. There's not enough air escape. So it's, a, it's annoying having to do all this because it takes time and everything. But it's not, not as I say, it's not that difficult. But and it doesn't have to be absolutely spot on. I mean, you don't have to be neurotic about it. As I said to the sequirus lady, I said if they just provided a a vial with 15 ml of saline, that would be fine too. How much is the vaccination? How much is the vaccination? I think it's about 100 and something dollars now. What about for the skin test? Yeah. A quarter of the price. A quarter of the so there's 14.5 ml. Okay, everybody happy? 14.5 ml? Give a minus, you know, whatever. So here's the skin test agent. So we're going to inject it in and mix it up. So you just inject in a little bit, suck it back. And you have to do this a few times, obviously, to make sure you get the dilutions correct. Can you do it as a multi? Yeah, this, so this is actually enough for about 100 people. Right. <laughs> but it only, it's only good for a day. So once you've made it up, so my suggestion is you actually have a, a clinic once a week, you know, say on a Thursday afternoon or something like that. And what you do then, uh, on one Thursday you actually do the skin tests and order the blood tests, and then on the following Thursday you do the vaccinations. So, so look, because of time I'm not going to do this to the nth degree, but obviously you've got to mix it so that it's... So with the vaccination, is it like the Rangers one where you can use the same file for half a dozen people? Or yeah, that's right. Because you've actually got 15 mLs in now, right? And in fact, what you need per person is 0.1. So you can actually do 150 people. <laughs> That's what I meant the vaccination, not just the skin. Oh, no, the, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, the vaccination is actually, um, um, they're all single, single syringes and 0.5. Okay. So now you've got to get 0.1 out of here. So the simplest thing is to put it into a sterile urine container. You've usually got those around, okay? So... So that's the, vac that's the skin test reagent, now one in, one in 30 dilution. Now, I would normally, because of time, I would mix it up and down a few more times, but uh, I haven't got enough time. So, and then, so that's, that's a little bit. And who's, who's my guinea pig? Can you change seats with this gentleman here, please? Five minutes, yes, yes, I'm going as fast as I can. Take your time. So you need a little, you need a little, a little. No, no, I've never had anyone die from this. For the, for, for the vaccine, you definitely need because you're giving much more. This is so dilute; it's almost homeopathic. This. Yes, you keep this in the fridge all day. Chuck it out at the end of the day, and and do label it. All right. So I'm not just because of the pressure of time, I'm not labelling it. Thank you. Can you, you, you just swipe him? Yeah, thanks very much. Good. Yes, please, preferably. <laughs> Have you ever had Q-Fever vaccination or Q-Fever? No, no, not as far as I know. Okay, all right. All right, so that's point one. Can everybody see point one? Air bubble's gone. Now, watch carefully here because this is the tricky part. This is an intradermal inoculation, which we don't normally do. Older doctors will have done it from the days of the Mantu testing. Have you done it? I've done it. I've done heaps of these. That doesn't mean I'm not going to mess this one up. But what you do, you have the bevel of the needle facing up, all right, and you go, was it clean here? You're going at about 10 degrees. Can you see I'm at about 10 degrees? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, thanks very much. That's a big help. And very, very superficially. See that? 
and you should see a blood form. See the blood form? Yeah. Can you see that, that little vesicle? Mm -hmm. That means I've done You're it properly. Identical with the man two test. Identical yeah. with the man two. Absolutely identical. If you've done a man two, um, where are the band aids? Oh, here they are. <laughs> Do you want a band aid? I one open by your elbow. Oh, oh, thank you so much. Right, now I can't see what. Oh, yes, I can. So I've got a flyover to Geelong in seven days, have I? <laughs> now, now, what you do, now give me your other arm. Let's say this is the arm you did it seven days ago, all right? Seven days. Now you can stretch it eight, nine, ten at the most, but you can't underdo it. So don't do it at five and six. Because it takes seven days for the T lymphocytes to react to this antigen and, and migrate there. And then you just run your finger across like that. Like that? And you feel, if, you can feel, <laughs> if you can feel any bump, yeah. it's positive. But if it looks oh, red or okay. anything, any bump is positive, and so don't vaccinate. Okay. And when you get the serology form back from the lab, if it says positive, don't vaccinate. Okay. Okay, so, so this is testing cell-mediated immunity. The serology is testing B cell or, or humoral immunity. Okay, folks, that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you. So this room will for the have a... For the vaccine oh, or the, um, or the um, skin test? Oh, for the vaccine. The vaccine, the main one would be anaphylaxis, but it's exceptionally rare. Exceptionally rare. Oh, okay. so, so you would normally have some adrenaline available. Sorry, I mean with okay. the second... Yes, like so yep. Time. So everybody, oh, we're having a, having a five-minute oh, break. They can, they can get really swollen. So that five uh, minutes allows arms, you to change room if you want. The, and the next mm -hmm. session in here and is like the months, mental months health focused yeah. psychological yes, strategies. Yes. 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 Hello. Hello. I just have a question. So I live uh, near Dubbo, actually. Near Dubbo. In Wellington. Yes. Oh, yes. We have a very large farming population. Yes, of course. In the yes. Of a yes. So. I know you said that generally you vaccinate young adults yeah. when they're coming into the workforce. That's what I recommend. But what about farming families where the children are yeah, involved in yeah. farming and cows? Well, you know, the vaccine the is not actually licensed for use in anyone under 15, but I have given quite a few children the vaccine where I deem that the risk is warranted. The reason it's not licensed is because it was never tested against children, not that there's anything wrong. I've done at least a dozen children, and I just reduced the dose of the vaccine according to their body weight. So if they're half an adult size, I'll give them